And together with Sarah, uh, Adri, and uh, our local defender, Alex Bobo. I uh, hope everyone is ready for this presentation. Uh, let's learn. Let's um, start in inbox. We have a concern. And uh, for clarification, you can drop some questions in inbox so that we will be able to go through and give you the feedback. Alex, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Keboy, and our listeners, wherever you are. We are excited to have you on board to deliberate on this uh, topic. I'm not presenting because I know so much, but uh, in these, we are going to share views, perspectives, so that we can improve uh, the practice in terms of renal nutrition because where we are, we have huge challenges when it comes to management of a uh, patient with chronic kidney diseases, because uh, we have divergent views and it's high time to try and synchronize this. As you'll see in moment's time, we'll share some slides showing how patients are feeling in terms of nutrition services we are giving to them and uh, what impact this has. To begin with, um, we, when we think about kidney disease, we have different types of kidney diseases. We have nephrotic syndrome, we have polycystic kidney disease, we have diabetic nephropathy, there are many, these are just few examples. And as a nutritionist, sometimes someone wonder, what diet do I give where? What do I check? Uh, in the midst of so much of uh, uh, controversies that existing, we'll be able to see a focused view on how to approach that. And the best thing to start maybe is to refresh our mind. I have a, in pictorial form something concerning kidney functions. If we have a better understanding in terms of what are the kidney functions? What it means is that when the kidney is not functioning well, these functions are affected. And uh, from nutrition point of view, there must be some inputs that to bring on board in terms of alleviating uh, the symptoms, uh, addressing issues of malnutrition, and even other things as, a, as one of the medical uh, team. Now, I've always been very prudent to understand the kidney function using estimate and GFR. We call it estimate and glomerular filtration rate. There are different formulas that exist, but there is one which is recommended, maybe we'll share after uh, towards the end of the presentation. So that when you get the UECs of the patient, it's important to check all lab tests and also try to check at what stage of kidney disease is patient at. Because from here, it makes a lot of difference. Otherwise, you have one size fit all type of diet, which is technically not uh, possible. And this is what is posing a lot of issues that we have. Different people telling patients different stories, patient getting confused. So as you can see this pictogram, when patient has a estimated GFR or kidney uh, function of uh, more than 90, is considered to have normal kidney function. If it's less than 90, but between 60, we, this one is categorized as early stage kidney disease. And uh, as you can see, between 60 and 15, not less than 15, this is where a patient has kidney disease. Kidney failure is when the estimated GFR is less than 15. And all patients who are arising on uh, maintenance hemodialysis, 
we have um, estimated GFR of 50. But there are some reservations because I've seen patients with estimated GFR of less than 15, but they have not yet started uh, dialysis. But what you'll find is that they are in preparation. Maybe patient is requested to have a fistula inst institute uh, and other uh, uh, structures being put in place so that in case of emergency, patient is starting on hemodialysis without uh, waste of time. So when there is renal insufficiency, what is likely to happen is that you might find this patient has the urine output uh, below what is expected or no urine output at all, elements of uremia. If ureas are high, as I've seen patients with urea of 60 in a confusion, uh, most often you find elevated sodium potassium, free overload, patient gasping, require oxygen, and to some extent you might find patients with a high serum and phosphorus. So, it's important when you are assessing or we are assessing patients to be able to understand holistically uh, which are the, are the presentation of each patient on case by case basis. Now, um, I thought this, uh, this graph would help us have a, a figure out what happens. When the patient GFR, estimated and glomerular filtration rate decline, you'll always find patient or renal patient at advanced CKD uh, having poor appetite. And as you can see, the estimated GFR at, of 90, that patient is expected to have optimal oral intake. But as the uh, EGFR continues to deteriorate, you find patient uh, or of, uh, intake decline. And actually notably at 15, estimated GFR of 15, we have what you call retention of appetite depressants. And there is no magic here you can do, even if you have best supplement, nutraceutical to give the patient. Until patient arises, that's the time you can resume to feed orally. And as you can see, uh, renal replacement therapy can entail uh, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, but in this context, we are going to deliberate a bit on hemodialysis. Once patient is, is a, a have a transplantation, you can see appetite actually improves drastically. And here, challenges are now different because the, uh, the issue there is management of diabetes uh, induced by immunosuppressants and also uh, managing weight because obesity prevalence is high in this population. So this picture, this graph paints to us that renal patient on hemodialysis or with C advanced C CKD have uh, challenges in terms of uh, oral intake. Uh, sorry, have another, a little bit clogged chart here, but it's try to explain in details what happens. And what we can pick here, there are a number of factors that come into play in this uh, uh, vulnerable population. When the kidney ability to concentrate urine decrease and decreases, there is a lot that happens. There is a lot that happens. There is metabolic acidosis, there is inflammation, there is abnormal repeat and carbohydrate metabolism, not to mention even abnormal hormonal response. And all these contribute to the nutrition status of the patient. Now, there is a common term. This term is uh, not very old, but it's now the one being used. We refer to it as uh, energy protein energy wasting. And as you can uh, see here, it's manifest when the estimated GFR is 40. And uh, it happens to around 75% of patients who are on dialysis. And uh, the most interesting bit is that uh, it's not only caused by lack of nutrient and energy, but there are other factors like metabolic disorders that, are, uh, that contribute to this one. And uh, I, I grabbed uh, one of the articles uh, published 
about protein energy wasting, what is it and what can we do? And I got some interesting bits here because uh, protein energy wasting, once you provide a required diet, you'd expect a good response in that. But now not with protein energy wasting because it's like opposite of what we know. Appetite is low. Inadequate nutrient intake just play a part of the role. Patient has high resting expendi uh, energy expenditure. There is increased fat mass, but uh, increased loss of lean mass. And uh, normally, it's not like other patients where by when you give dietary supplements, you are able to troubleshoot this fully. So in this uh, article, the summary here uh, summarizes that um, protein energy wasting is the main cause of poor nutrition plus chronic, uh, is a response of poor nutrition, but uh, in addition to chronic inflammation. And therefore it means uh, besides supporting patient nutritionally, there are other factors that are supposed to be considered. For example, adequacy in terms of dialysis and management of metabolic acidosis. Now, I have picked some few statistics to show uh, the landscape of nutrition status for hemodialysis patients. And these are shocking statistics because uh, the global prevalence of malnutrition among hemodialysis is estimated to be between 28 to 54. Uh, but now also you find literature uh, indicating that uh, the prevalence also is dependent on the type of nutrition assessment that has been used. But based on a subjective global assessment, dialysis malnutrition score, Recent studies from China, Iran, Tanzania, and here in Kenya, you can see they are high as 88. So this study was uh, done last year in Kenya, not uh, yet to be published, but uh, it demonstrated that the prevalence of malnutrition among hemodialysis patients is still very high. And the question is where are nutritionists, what are the factors contributing to these? in medical multiple disciplinary team, what are we supposed to do? Because uh, poor, pro, uh, poor nutrition status among hemodialysis patients is associated with poor prognosis. So it means that as far as renal patients who are dialyzing, they are concerned, there is uh, uh, some urgent measures that need to be undertaken. But in this field, there is a very interesting story altogether. One, a few months ago, I think it's four weeks ago, a month ago, I found a patient, an obese patient with high BMI values. And he, she asked me one question, uh, what should I do? Because uh, I was told that I should uh, reduce my weight. I need to have some lean weight. And I was shocked because what I know Renal patients, the higher weight they can afford, the better for them because of the prognosis associated with poor nutrition status. And I thought it's very important because also it gives us a, a benchmark so that once we are intervening, to what extent do we need to push or at what point can we say we are safe? There is something we call obesity paradox. Other terms that uh, refer to this is uh, we call it a reverse epidemiology. As you can see, the relative risk of dying and uh, body mass index for general population, the higher BMI, the higher risk of dying. But for hemodialysis patients, the higher the BMI, the better the survival rate. And all through recent studies, as you read through, you find that even the cap for BMI in, in renal patients who are dialyzing has been put at 23. So what it means here is that we should, we should try as much as possible to ensure that uh, the rising patients, they have BMI is at least around 23 or more because it offers them unique protection as compared to traditional BMI of 18 that we know above 18 for healthy population. Uh, now, 
we have seen the statistics and we are worried about what is causing renal patients to have a high prevalence of malnutrition. But I was trying to get trouble to this and find out for simple explanation, although this is not the only uh, explanation. I got this study that has been published three years ago also. Factors associated with adherence to dietary prescription among adults patients with chronic kidney disease on hemodialysis in national referral hospitals in Kenya. So this study was done at Ken H and Moi referral. And uh, this one is an open access. You can grab the copy. But what uh, caught my attention is the adherence that out of a hundred patients that you are likely to attend, knowing the importance of dietary adherence, is that 40% are the one likely to stick to instructions given. And you wonder what happens to the other 60? What would be the cause of poor adherence? This study, the researcher did a qualitative study and also quantitative study. And I was able to get the other bit of quantitative study on perception on adherence to dietary prescription. Uh, actually, this had now more insight trying to back up the quantitative study. And what was coming out, the main theme was that patients get confusing information from one nutritionist to the other, from nurses, from doctors, from patients themselves, until you can see here they are saying, some they come and confuse us, some they come and tell us to do this, that. One comes and tell you this. Now, sometimes you get confused and you don't get message very well. And as this person concludes this confusion, that is confusion because one person will tell you this while the other will tell you don't eat that. And another patient there also uh, from Sierra, that one was from Nyeri. Another one, female patient from Sierra say there is a problem because we have many nutritionists these days. One comes here and tells you this tomorrow, another one tells you that something different, so you don't understand anything. Yes, that makes me sometimes decide on my own what to do. So you can't know if maybe this one is telling the truth, maybe the other one is lying. If I eat something and it doesn't harm me, I'll eat it the next day. So that's where we are, that's where we are. So that's why I say this presentation is not more of a that we are the ones who know, but we need to, to figure out, we need to come clear, we need to have strategy, we need to lay mechanisms so that we can be able to support patients, knowing that the, the right now the prevalence of malnutrition among hemodialysis is that high. And then the problem doesn't stop there. Sorry, this chart is not very uh, well legible, but it's a study done different in a, by a American Dietetic Association, but I found these findings very contextually fitting in our setting because it depicts some of also problems that are facing us. Perceived barrier to referrals of hemodialysis patients to nutrition uh, to nutritionists. You remember a referral system is an entry point to nutrition care process, yeah? And it means that if patients are not referred, there is no way we'll have uh, uh, to reach these patients. Sometimes you get them yourself as a nutritionist. Sometimes, most of the time, these patients are referred by other healthcare professionals. <laughs> Excuse me. But now what is here is that um, some patients, if you read those studies I've been able to share, what comes out is that, like in Ken H, you, their patient were saying that they are not able to get nutrition services due to cost. NHLF does not cover counseling services, and therefore patients will always try to avoid to go to nutrition office because they'll be requested to pay an extra fee. But the story is different 
in my referral whereby the NHIF covers for outpatient nutrition services consultation. And you can see from this chart that uh, patients sometimes are not able to get services due to costs they need to pay out of their pocket. In other instance, uh, physicians who are seeing patients decide to cancel patients themselves. I have a challenge. It's not bad, but perhaps I would think that it would be wise to direct them where they can get full support. Because the nutrition counseling to renal patient is not one time thing. It's a journey that you walk with the patient and there is no size or fit all size kind of a diet. It's back and forth. And uh, as you move and patient is improving clinically, you keep adjusting until you reach the target, which are very unique and different from each and every patient. Also, physician lack of time to refer or does not think about referring is very common. Even when you go to outpatient clinics, you might find that. Lack of physician awareness of available nutrition services. I don't know whether this is the same. Lack of patient interest in being referred to another professional. I've seen patient being referred not once, not twice, and I don't think uh, they feel that, uh, ah, in, Going to nutrition it is not really something very important. Until they come with hyperkalemia, feed overload, that's the time now you have to attend to them. And these are things that can be addressed much earlier and save a lot. So what is the way forward? What we are saying here is that we need to read from the same scripts we need to understand the best approaches to support with our patients so that we can be able to speak same language and be able to achieve adherence target. The group target is about 50%. We are way below group target so that we can support these patients. And uh, these are suggestions, and it's not something new. Applying evidence-based nutrition is very important. Use of the best available research, latest guideline, consensus statement, consider patient value, and apply clinical expertise. We'll come to that. Also, avoid unnecessary dietary restriction. We need to manage patients case by case. For me, I don't sit in a group of patients giving them counseling. It's not scientific because you'll mislead many while you think that you're attending to some. You'll see that, uh, we'll see that as we go to, uh, to management. So as you can see, unless you are using evidence-based principles, I can't hear a word you are saying. But you see, also uh, application of evidence-based practice is something that someone need to put more effort to be able to uh, excel in that. So suggested approach in patient nutrition assessment uh, or intervention before you intervene, it's very important to have a thorough assessment of the patient. There is nutrition focused physical examination. There is um, use of client history data, there is use of anthropometric data, there is, it's important to check uh, food and nutrition history, but I just uh, uh, thought it for emphasis uh, purposes, it's important to have this biome uh, biomedical data. You need to check sodium, you need to have potassium levels, you need to know phosphor levels, where possible, but sometimes you might find patient does not have these lab results. So if you cancel patient when you don't know lab results, you might be, it's very tricky, very tricky. You might be telling patient to reduce on sodium while sodium levels are too low. And that's why it's important to review a patient 
or to intervene when the patient has the latest lab results. But in case you don't have lab results or they are not available, it's important to make a prudent decision so that uh, you don't uh, compromise uh, the kind of care that you provide to a patient. So these lab results are very important, but uh, creatinine level is, is you use creatinine level to determine estimated GFR for you to know the disease staging. You might have a patient that rising, but once you check the lab result creatinine level, you might find the patient is on a different stage. That means the estimated GFR might be even more than that or 40. The, the kidney functions to some of these patients keep changing. And you might, like for example, if a patient started dialysis when the estimated GFR is 15, and as time goes by, it improves to around 40. I'll be smiling because some of the restrictions would be lifted. For example, you cannot uh, tell patients to check on phosphor, to soak legumes, avoid whole grain cereals if the estimated GFR is more than 40. So you give them some degree of freedom so that they can improve on their diet diversification. So also check the urine output. It's very important. When you have a patient who has urine output more than 1,000 mil, it's not the same as when you have a patient who, has, who is anuric. Also understand the existing nutrition knowledge. Get to know what do you know about your diet? What were you told? So that you can be able to help the patient get the facts and made uh, clear. And also food pattern. It's very interesting. Like in the morning, I handled a patient and this patient called me, you see, I've been eating a whole grain cereal. Okay. And uh, that's what I've been eating. And I was like, there, should I tell the patient to stop? But then I could not make proper judgment at that point because if I had serum phosphor level, latest serum phosphor level, and they are within the range, then I think for this particular patient, I will not have cause of honor to tell the patient, no, 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 stop. But if they are bordering, then I would think it would be very appropriate to tell the patient otherwise. So those are the considerations that we need to make when we are handling this patient. Remember, ovary restricted diet put patient to more risk of malnutrition. There is a recent guideline, KDUQI Clinical Practice Guideline for Nutrition in CKD 2020 update. And this guideline has very interesting uh, uh, statements. For example, one of them is that we used to know that uh, patients on hemodialysis should be on high protein, protein of high biological value and not a brim of animal protein. For this uh, guideline, right now it's quiet. It doesn't really mention that. Instead, it's really advocating for plant-based diet because of some of the advantages that are associated with that. So what this guideline is saying is that it's reasonable to prescribe medical nutrition therapy that is tailored to individual needs and nutrition status in consider uh, together with consideration with other comorbid conditions. So what is the renal diet? Even myself, I don't really have an answer to this. I don't have answer to this, but I think we should have a label of a certain diet that, because from practice, it's, it's really challenging. Last week I had a patient who had come for dialysis, had two low phosphor levels, sodium was 125, everything was low. And then here, I would label diet, renal diet to give to the patient. And then I find my hands tired. So elements should be modified on individual basis. There are some instances you find patient require sodium restriction, there are other situations that you need to add some little more salt. Because if patient is not, on, most of the, okay, all hemodialysis patients, they are outpatient. Unless they have medical issues, they, you find them in hospital setting. So they come and go home. 
So in case their sodium levels are low, they are corrected using dietary measures. And that's why it's important to have a close surveillance of these patients through their lamb results so that to understand uh, on time where they are. So when you think of sodium, don't always think of low sodium. There can be at times patient will require high sodium diet or normal sodium diet. When you think of potassium, sometimes it's not always low potassium diet. Sometimes it may require more than um, moderate or some little more potassium diet. Same case with phosphorus. But we know protein for hemodialysis patients, it's high protein that we don't refute. Uh, it's the same uh, through the guidelines. But for European uh, Aspen guideline, uh, there is some slight difference. Some talk of 1.2, others 1.2, but 1.2 is a good a place to start. So with that, perhaps uh, we can, uh, in this presentation, I said we are trying to bring our minds together so that we can be able to see how best we can be able to synchronize our messages and our practice uh, in, within, in, in our country. When you think of uh, restricting potassium, when should we tell patients to have uh, a low potassium diet. Okay, I try to check some of the guidelines and uh, research available. What is evident is that once patient has end stage renal disease, it's important to restrict potassium. That is estimated GFR of 15 mils per minute. But uh, when between uh, estimated GFR of uh, 60 and 20, uh, 15, that is CKD stage three and five, it's very important to keep an eye, to be cautious. And when there is high potassium during that point, it's important to tell the patient to have what, to have uh, a low potassium diet. So here, but if you find a patient who has 1.2, 1.5 mils or 1.5 liters of urine output, rarely you find them have incidences of hyperkalemia. But what is important is that try to have lab, uh, check, uh, lab, uh, lab, uh, lab data. You can try to check over months, several months, how has the patient been able to control the serum potassium to be able to have proper picture on how to advise the patient. So now this is where a lot of stories are. Some patients will tell you, I was told not to eat green, to only eat green apple. And you wonder, what hell with red apple? What about the other apple? What is the difference? Is it significant that who is who, who is telling the truth? And that's why I say, even as I speak, I really don't know if there is truth, which truth is it. But I want to invite you to have a look at some of the uh, work that has been done so that we can agree, we can have consensus statement on where to go. I find that some literature, depending on where you are browsing, we talked about uh, evidence-based nutrition. This data, I found it from um, FAO, and I tried to categorize fruits based on their potassium content. And I'm sure some of those who are practicing renal nutrition, they have a different way of going about this. But fruits generally are under three categories. We have low potassium fruits, we have medium potassium fruits, we have high potassium fruits. And you can see the amount per serving, amount per serving. And you can see the limit, three exchanges of low potassium, two exchanges of medium, one exchange for high potassium. But in the real world, in practice, Rarely do we tell patients to take three exchanges of low potassium fruit. An example for this, maybe I can put across that. When you think of a low potassium fruit, 
It means patient can eat three different types of the same per day that will give potassium load equivalent to a high potassium food. And that okay. is our, around the maximum of 500. So still I try to dig deeper and uh, this is what I found that um, although potassium food, fruits that you can categorize around there, although this list is not exhaustive and I would invite you to have a look at it and see how we can build it better. This is how it presents. We are in agreement that banana, avocado, passion fruits, they are high potassium fruits. But when it comes to other fruits like papaya, oranges, and then back to lower potassium fruits, that's where challenges, uh, we have a lot of challenges. Because you find a patient is saying, oh, um, I, I was told to eat only green apples. And sometimes I'm shocked. Ah, patient is saying, I was told to eat mango. I wonder, could mango be right for patient to eat? So this is how uh, food, uh, food science uh, categorize fruits based on that. And what it means is that we can comfortably advise our patient based on this. But caution is that Hyperkalemia is very prevalent in hemodialysis patients together with fluid overload. So I think it's always prudent when patient tells me I was told not to eat this and this and this and this. Though it's highly restrictive, but I always assume that the nutritionist who was attending to patient was trying to pray safe so that you don't have this incidence, especially where patient follow-up is not very good. But if you have a good follow-up to the patient, the surveillance is good at times you can be a little bit liberal but with a lot of caution depending on the appearance of each and every patient so also there are different ways of trying to reduce uh, potassium uh, sorry i forgot to mention that when you think of potassium potassium is a literary uh, it's high in great amount in root tubers all types of vegetables and fruits. But for fruit, we choose the ones with moderate low potassium. For root tubers, patients are advised to avoid. But still, I've gotten patients telling you, oh, how so I can peel my potatoes, then I put them in water for 30 minutes, and then I boil. I try to check. Maybe we need context-specific studies that we can be able to rely. The last I checked is that uh, the best way you can prepare potatoes per serving that you'll end up will give you 700 milligrams. And you can see uh, potato is that cheap food and there is no way a patient can take half a serving. So if you imagine a patient can go to two servings or three servings, we are talking about over 2,000 milligrams of potassium. That is a higher load than what is recommended. And it poses huge risk to patients, especially now knowing that manifestation of hyperkalemia, patient doesn't, uh, can't feel easily that the potassium are high. Most of them come for checkup and they are admitted immediately because potassium levels are high. But it's, it, as I'm saying, there, is, there are different ways of doing these things. And that's why we really need to have a consensus on how to go about it. But for other vegetables, uh, for vegetables, we are in agreement that patients should chop vegetables, boil them in plenty of water for a short dura duration and immediately drain the water. For carrots, eggplant, pilipili homo and the like, Still, patient can do the same. And you find patient telling you, I was told not to eat carrot because it's a root tuber. Yes, it's a root tuber, I agree. But you see, we need to have a bigger picture. We are talking about potassium load of certain amount, around 2,400 milligrams. Some literature talk about uh, 39.1 gram per ideal body weight. So it's the load, it's not the food. Uh, food article on its own. It's the total amount patient consume the whole day. 
that should not exceed a certain limit. All right, now the issue of phosphor is that um, when do you tell patient to go slow on phosphor rich diet? Some studies are showing that estimated GFR of less than 29, some 30, but I agree that fairly at 30 going below, it's a right time for you to think about low phosphorus diet. And in most cases, you find patient has uh, elevated serum phosphorus. And the recommended load per day is 800 And uh, what I've captured here is that so when you think of potassium rich foods, uh, we have um, all types of legumes and cereals and nuts. And of course, we have different types of uh, phosphorus presentation. We have uh, inorganic uh, phosphorus and we have organic phosphorus. When it comes to organic, also we have broad uh, classification. We have uh, phytates that are found in legumes and we have also organic phosphorus that's found in meat and uh, meat products. So even their bioavailability is different. Uh, studies show that in organic phosphorus absorption rate, their bioavailability amounts to up to 90%. But when you come to fight it, legumes that have fight it, the phosphorus uh, absorption rate is between 30 to 40%. And when it comes to meat, it can and meat products, the nature of phosphorus there can be absorbed up to 60%. So whenever you are choosing foods that are having dietary phosphorus loads, which is low, it's good to compare the protein and the phosphorus availability. Any food that has phosphorus protein ratio of 12 milligrams per one gram of protein presents to be a very good protein for that, for your patient. And the catch here is that sometimes it's practically not easy to achieve 1.2 grams of protein per ideal body weight without exceeding the phosphorus load. So the best way to go about it, please be checking on the ratio, phosphorus protein ratio. Others, when you check on absolute phosphorus, what will happen, you take care of phosphorus, but you not meet the protein requirements. But when you use phosphorus protein ratio, you're able to achieve the protein requirements and also take care of uh, dietary phosphorus load. So these are phosphorus pyramid guide. It's an old uh, visual tool done some time back, 2015. I'm trying to customize this, actually to adapt it, sorry. And it summarizes everything here at the base. These are the foods that can be consumed. But of course, with knowledge, because now if we talk about vegetables, there is a way we treat vegetables. But we know very well uh, vegetables are a rich source of potassium and not phosphorus. But what is important here is that one, like for eggs, Patients should not eat more than three eggs a month. If patient has to eat more than one egg a day, just to remove the yolk and improve phosphorus protein ratio. So patient can have three, four, five, six, seven, or even 10 eggs, and unless the patient tolerance to eggs is not good. For legumes, the basic method of treating is to treat overnight, to soak overnight in large volumes of water, then in the morning to rinse, and then during boiling, to boil using a lot of water, okay? And if possible, even pour water in between there. And uh, another thing is that once it was well cooked, immediately to discard. But there is a study we are doing showing very interesting thing. There are some legumes when they are soaked for long hours, the phosphorus tend to be, but uh, to raise. While there are others uh, that they have actually very low amount of phosphorus such that even cooking without soaking will, will, will still be within. But uh, 
the study is yet to be concluded so that we can uh, be able to see the validity of that data before we share it. For animal protein, uh, meat, you, all types of meat can be consumed, but meat soup is not uh, supposed to be taken. Uh, and therefore, uh, if, if it's red meat, chop in small pieces, boil in large volume of water. When it's done, patients should remove, uh, put, uh, set aside that part of the meat without the soup and then can prepare the way uh, he or she wants. If it's internal meat organs, once a week, but should be prepared the same way as other meat. Now, for nuts, yolk here stands for whole egg, hard cheese and all that. So some of the foods that are known to be rich in potassium, uh, phosphorus, uh, two to three serves. Now, for organic, inorganic phosphorus rich foods like processed meats, uh, cora beverages, the aim here is to avoid as much as possible. But what I will say is that uh, you see most of the commercial foods that are put on supermarket shelves, even in developed countries, they don't have labels indicating the phosphorus content. The rule doesn't require for them to indicate how much phosphorus is it. And this one poses a lot of challenges because patients and even practitioners are not able to make appropriate decisions. And that's why it's important patient to stick as much as possible to whole foods. But uh, when it comes to diabetic patients, it's, there is a different twist there because uh, for Nutritionists dealing with uh, diabetic patients, uh, they'll tell patients to eat a uh, whole grain cereal. But when you get to the other side, patient is diabetic and has uh, kidney failure, they are rising, their uh, serum phosphorus are raising, then the advice here is that they should go on processed cereals. There is no much literature when it comes to diabetic nephropathy, but the, what is available here is that opt for processed cereal. That is to say, if it's ugari, it should be uh, pro, from uh, processed flour and so on. But another interesting bit is that patients who are diabetic and have kidney failure Somewhat they tend to have their blood sugar controlled. Yeah, and even you have their uh, hypoglycemic uh, dosage uh, titrated down. So it also serves as a, as a plus on this. And that's why even when they have uh, processed cereal, they are able to have their control of blood sugar in order. So from to this point, as I conclude, the challenges we are having with renal patients is uh, diet is very monotonous. Palatability is a problem because I find some patients are told, oh, I was told to eat cabbage. Cabbage is low in potassium. Kienyeji bogas are very high in potassium. So patients cabbage from January to December. That's why I say uh, we are to agree. We are to agree on this so that we can be able to, to, to scale the practice. Then another thing is that involving food preparation methods. When you look at how renal diet uh, is being prepared, it's really tasking and some of, these are some of the things that make patients adherence to be low. Also think of the cost of food preparation. If someone was buying paraffin to cook boga and uh, ugari uh, worth 50 shillings, if you start boiling vegetables uh, or boiling another food there, the kerosene will end before the ugari is done. And uh, lack of content specific menu. 
or recipe. So these are some of the, I know risk can be uh, extended, but these are some of the donor issues that we really need to address to be able to help this population. And uh, I want to stop at that point so that I can invite your reaction. I said I was not, I'm not the one who know about renal diet. We are just sharing experiences. Then we give our thoughts and uh, we see how best we can be able to move ahead. Remember, we don't have national guidelines for renal nutrition. Well, we need to put one in place that perhaps can make it better. But we thank our government because uh, it has really done a lot through Ministry of Health. Like now, as we speak, KMTC is offering higher diploma in nutrition. So we have the first batch of nutritionists that are specially, they are training in Reno. And we hope that by the time they are coming out, we'll have now, we'll start beginning to have a change in the practice. Thank you very much. Uh, you are actually narrowed it down. Uh, but any other form of interest that you think we have it? Um, and uh, this uh, presentation has been so much exhausting. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe we can go through some questions. Uh, so, and uh, I'll find it. And I'm going to go to Alima Tapena. Is that uh, do we have a basic nutritional guidelines for the Oh, basic. Uh, that, do we have a basic nutritional guidelines for renal disease? We don't have, but um, there is a nutritional dietetic manual from Ministry of Health. That has some component there, but it's not really exhaustive. That's what I'm saying. We need to have one. We need to have one. Okay, thank you. A question from uh, Khaled Rono. Does protein, does presence of protein in urine, uh, urine enough to the non uh, Actually, uh, Khaled uh, wants to say that if the presence of protein in the urine can be used to the abnormal, uh, I think that question would be best answered by a nephrology, but I'll try. Uh, there is a presence of protein in urine alone cannot do diagnosis of, uh, uh, of kidney failure alone. Remember, we in this chart, I don't know where it is, we have different conditions like uh, we have nephrotic syndrome, we have we have different conditions, but they all end up to CKD. And by the time, sorry, it not have that definition. By the time patient reaches to CKD, there is a lot that is happening. There is structural part of it, and there is functional part of it. You can get a patient who is a um, is having chronic kidney disease based on the functional bit of it. And uh, you a structural bit, bit of it, but you find the UECs are almost normal. So one one criteria that is not sufficient to 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 say that patient has CKD. Okay. Uh, Requirements in the hemodialysis patients, since most of them 
tends to have low HP level standard the procedure and some and some terms are needed. Um, Yes, I consider that there are different types of uh, anemia. So you have to identify the part of all what is the type of anemia that the patient has. There is lymphocytic uh, anemia, normocytic anemia, and macrocytic uh, anemia. So if the patient has microcytic anemia, then you can correct it nutritionally. And there's the vertical parameters that you should check, like the HB and the mean capacity of body, for certain which type of anemia it is. So it is not necessary that all the time that it's a blanket, uh, a blanket thing that a patient has is on uh, it's exactly the same thing on on hemodialysis that it is to a certain that they have a high efficiency anemia. So if, uh, for instance, because most of the time you find that renal patients do have uh, long anemia of chronic illness, which is uh, normocytic anemia. It doesn't mean that it should be corrected using iron supplementation. But if the case, if it is a uh, with anemia, you will correct it using iron supplementation. And so, sometimes you find it's a medical cell such as developer being provided and, uh, and a subscript to actually the uh, And maybe to add that is that. Uh, there is a whole guideline uh, in terms of uh, uh, anemia management in CKD that I would perhaps uh, request you to have a look at it. I'm not able to trace it, but it's there. There is a protocol. There is a whole protocol because uh, prevalence of uh, refractive anemia is very common in CKD, knowing very well the function, kidney, hormonal function, kidney does. So you'll find patient is put on erythropoietin, uh, uh, a certain dosage, either once a week, it will depend. And also patients are put on um, uh, iron supplementation. And to some extent, at worst situation, patient will require transfusion intradiaresis. So it's good to, under, to work as a team, a medical team, to understand and agree with a, a nephrologist on board of to what extent or from where your input should be able to come on board. Sometimes the business has to come. Uh, apologies for the interruption. We cannot hear you well. Kindly adjust your mic or move closer to the mic. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm posing a question to me. I'm saying that uh, you for the presentation. Uh, if I go to you here, you uh, talk about time here in the result of the analysis center. What if the patient, we want to is that we still maintain the same amount? Uh, a very attentive listener. So for 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 diabetic patient, uh, I need to confirm that I I, I won't be lying. But what is true, if you check, is that most of 
renal patients, even those who are having diabetic, because 40% of patients who are diabetic will end up with nephropathy. So it's a very significant population. And uh, as you see them, is that majority of these will have poor nutrition status. What we are trying to say is that it's not high BMI. We are saying internationally agreed cutoff for hemodialysis patients, the BMI should be at 23. And 23, it's within the healthy range. So we are not talking about BMI of 40 or that, but at least not uh, all patients, if they are within the rest at BMI of 23, and slightly above, it would be better than BMI less than 23. That is within the consensus. Yes. What is the Yes, it's one of them. BMI is closer to but not less than That's what the communication is not about. Most of the patients, depending on the kind of eating that you see, an insulin promotes um, uh, anabolism, that is uh, synthesis of the new. Um, the, the patient actually may get more weight. And therefore, uh, we need to individualize the thing. What Alex was saying was the higher the BMI, the better the prognosis. That is actually what we are talking about. So, another question from Anonymous uh, they try to explain how to manage fluid intake in the early stage of the disease situation. All right, all right. I thought that is a topic for another day. I skipped that intentionally. I think there's a lot we need to exhaust, and we could not put all fruits in one basket. But for the sake of the audience who has asked, um, studies have shown that patients have better control of their fluid management than other nutrients. Probably because when they are being diarized, the nurse the nephrology nurse will always remind them, hey, Leo, tumekutoa maji mingi sana. Unafinyo maji, tafadhali punguza. So that frequent reminder gives them uh, a good chance to be able to be keen on their fluids. So general guidelines concerning field management is that um, always it's good to consider fluid output, uh, urine output for the last 24 hours, fluid output, urine output for the last 24 hours. Uh, then from there, you add 500 ml. So we are talking about urine output. Uh, yeah, we are talking about uh, urine output. Urine output last, uh, last 24 hours. Uh, then uh, add 500, it's considered that an adult one we normally lose around 500 ml through sweat if patient does not have the element of fluid overload. So this one gives you a, a, a range at which the next 24 hours patient should not exceed. Remember, we don't tell patient not to take water. What we tell the patient is that the term fluid is a, a general, it's a broad term. Fluid entails water, tea, soup, and even uh, some juices in fruits. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it, all that liquid put together. So if patient doesn't have an element of fluid overload, it's always important for them to try to get accurate measurements of their urine output for the last 24 hours, then add 500, I'm able to know now from this time going ahead next 24 hours, the amount I should not be able to exceed. And it will be, you find it's interesting, even if patients are diarising, each patient presents uniquely. There is a patient who is diarising, but I will tell you, I'm achieving 1.5 liters. 
And if that is the case, then you smile because the patient will have a, a bit a degree of freedom in terms of how much the patient is able to cost. I hope I've answered you. I'll take the Um, thank you so much, uh, the CPD team, Kenyatta National Hospital, for this presentation. We have worked all around to make sure that uh, we give you the best, we give you the guideline, uh, the, the guiding principle in managing this patient. And um, having that, uh, we have uh, more questions, uh, we end up the meeting. Thank you so much.